to respond to to you will receive a, a, a notice um, to be able to um, accept for the recording. We've allocated time at the end of the meeting to respond to questions received in advance from members of the public and we have uh, one of those questions which we will come to. So thank you again everyone for joining us. Um, I want to start first with asking if anyone has any conflicts of interest to declare in relation to this agenda. The conflicts of uh, interest register that we have is uh, constantly being updated and will be updated again and uh, presented at the next board meeting again. Um, but if there are any particular conflicts for today's agenda, could you please indicate that to me now? Just going across the screens and no, thank you. So I'm going to start now by turning to our CEO, Fiona Edwards. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, delighted to be here at our first public board meeting. Um, and uh, after just two and a half weeks being in a position to uh, share and to discuss some critical issues uh, for the residents of the Frimley system. It's also at a really challenging time for public service and uh, the health and care aspects. In fact, all, especially with the heat wave we're experiencing at the moment, but post pandemic um, and the uh, pressures in terms of demand are uh, everyone is aware of um, the experience uh, of our services that this board uh, leads and represents and partners partners with and it's really important to note how high demand is we've had some of the highest attendances in our emergency departments ever uh, in experience um, and we've also got uh, something like a 15 percent increase in uh, activity and people being seen in primary care from before the pandemic. So access has continues to be a challenge, but more people are being seen across the system, but also there's a uh, huge risk and demand. Um, and we've, some of you will be aware that we've run some quite open uh, public campaigns, particularly in Slough, to help with people knowing where they will get a best response for their need. Um, rather than uh, turning up in our emergency departments, especially when some of those attendances, a, a significant proportion do not convert into needing treatment. So um, difficult messages that we need to be talking with our public about, but also huge stress and strain across the system. Um, and the system partnership in Frimley has worked really well, particularly over the last two weeks to address those. Um, and we're also doing work for the longer term. So as my report uh, in the papers uh, stresses, we are looking and work doing a really rapid piece of work around our urgent and emergency uh, care processes, which goes across primary care, emergency departments, ambulance services, social care, and also primary care, because all components of the system, um, the way they work affect how we can respond. There isn't one single answer to solving the pressures. And also we will be, as I've said in the report, be as we uh, develop some conclusions some proposals for potential changes, we'll obviously be working with the public on that as well. Um, at the moment, we're in very much the discovery phase of that work, whilst also trying to address um, the uh, immediate pressures that we're facing. And particularly, it's important to note that it's not just physical health, it's mental health. We've seen a huge national upsurge in demand and increase in waiting times, both for adults with mental health issues, but also children. And that's why it's so important that we spend time and we've already invested attention and effort in trying to get a clear path forward for children and young people, which we're, we're coming to 
on the agenda because um, demand and, and weights there for assessment um, are um, having a devastating effect on families and practitioners, uh, both in our system, but also across the country as well. So, um, but we're trying to make sure we're really gearing up our approach. It's a critical priority for the integrated care system. Um, and in spite of all those pressures and demands and needing to rethink and unlearn and try to do things differently together and in rapid order, we are doing incredibly well. Um, as well, where vaccination programmes continue to run, run, Frimley continues to be, as a system, uh, a leading uh, vaccinator, um, whether it be on boosters or um, and, uh, and the plans uh, moving forward, but also on planned care and waiting list recovery. Um, we will we'll be aiming to share more data, because we've only been two and a half weeks in operation for our next board, where we can see the comparative system performance um, but 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 I can assure members of the public here as well as the board that comparatively uh, our Frimley Health uh, organisation partners are doing a phenomenal job um, in uh, delivering an address against the national targets for recovery of waiting times not least helped by the hope opening of Heatherwood um, Hospital but but it's just when you think of the pressures everyone's facing and also being able to sustain addressing the waiting list and planned care um, comparatively, it's not where we want it to be, but comparatively we'd, we continue to do well through teamwork and system collaboration. So um, the agenda is deliberately focused in population health terms because we have to frame our thinking to, to address our strategic goal of addressing health inequalities um, and children and families and really addressing the upsurge in demand we've got, but also the unequal outcomes that children um, experience across the system um, is really important to us. So uh, this agenda is, uh, I think, focusing on the right things in terms of the future. Um, whilst it, we have to acknowledge the significant pressures and how we could be distracted um, by very, very real danger and risk that we're holding across public services at the moment. But uh, that's it from me, Priya. Thank you, Fiona. Let me um, ask now the team any comments, questions. Thank you, I'm looking across. Okay, I think it's really important for us now to uh, work through our agenda. So we are starting um, with what is the data telling us, looking then at our core uh, building block of our workforce, and then the deep dive into one of our priority areas with significant immediate pressures, uh, children and young persons. And then we'll move through to use of resources and into quality and safety, and then bring us, round us off with updates um, for where we are uh, with next steps for system development. So let me hand over now to Sam Burrows and to Lalitha Iyer with our population and health outcomes. Thanks very much, Priya, and thank you, Ollie, for sharing the slides. Um, I'm just going to say a couple of words quickly on this uh, by way of setup, and then Lalitha will take us through um, for the our geography. So, um, in terms of our geography and the Frimley system, we have five places and around 850,000 people who live within those across those five places. Um, we cover East Berkshire, parts of Surrey and parts of Hampshire. Um, and our five places are all very different and have a diverse range of communities who live within them. Um, the purpose of bringing this presentation to the board today is to provide some further information to the board about our populations, about their needs um, and how they access health care and broader public services um, and where we know there are inequalities uh, amongst the services that we provide today. Now I wanted to just say and share with the board that this is only really possible because of our connected care platform. Um, for those who don't know much about that, it's our shared 
digital and data architecture, which allows us to better understand a lot more about our population and their needs, regardless of which part of the public sector is providing their services. We're one of the only places in the country that has this capability, and it's the bedrock of what you're about to see. So um, I'll hand over to Aletha, who I'm sure wants to introduce herself as well, um, and she'll take you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Sam. So I'm Lalita Ayer. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the ICB. And before I begin, I just want to say that I have no Wi-Fi, so I'm tethered off my phone. So if I switch my camera, it's only because signal is not as strong. Um, and if I completely drop out of the meeting, Sam's promised that he will take over. But I'm fingers crossed, hoping none of that will happen. Next slide, please. So this slide may seem a bit busy, but if I could just very quickly take you through this. In the first column, you see our five places that Sam mentioned, Bracknell, North East Hampshire, Farnham, RBWM, which comprises of Windsor, Ascot and Maidenhead, Slough and Surrey Heath. The next column goes through the number of people who belong to these places. And for the purposes of clarity, I just want to say that this is the number of people who are registered with a GP within this place. So they might actually live outside the ICS, but they are counted within these numbers because connected care picks up data from GP records for a lot of things. So if you look at, say, a place like Northeast Hampshire and Farnham, which is the second one there, we've got 254,000 people. It tells you what the average age of the population there is. It's 40.9, but it then breaks down the place into the networks. So you've got PCNs of the five different PCNs, but you'll see that Aldershot, for example, has a slightly younger population. Um, and similarly, if you go to the next column, which tells you the percentage of our uh, population who are from the Black Asian and minority ethnic communities. Let's go down to Slough, which has a population of 176,000 people approximately. 61% of them actually are from the uh, BAME, if I could use the term, BAME ethnic groups. And if you then look at the multi-generational household, so this is a household where you might have grandparents living along with parents and then the children, so the grandchildren and the grandparents, so vulnerable people living along with a young mobile population. We saw this really impact COVID, for example. You see that across the ICS, there's about 5% of households, but in Slough, you've got 11% of households. Gives you a picture. And similarly, the next column is about how many households have more than five people living within it. And again, you'll see, if you look down the column, most places around 27% or so, but in Slough, it's closer to 50%. And the last column is probably the most important one, which talks about the, uh, the deprivation deciles. So um, the deprivation deciles are classed at zero to 10, zero, uh, one to 10 rather, and one being the most deprived population and 10 being the most affluent. And you will notice that as an ICS, most places are six and above, compared to Slough, which is around four. So most of our deprived population lives within Slough. And I'd like to again point out that if you look at Northeast Hampshire and Farnham, the old 7.5, look at Aldershot, the deprivation decile is at 5.3. Next slide, please. So all the slides seem busy, so I will take you through very briefly. Now this slide is just to show you that it's not just um, NHS information, they are now able to pull social care data and information such as barriers to housing, uh, education training, the income deprivation affecting children, affecting older people, and so on. And again, as a general theme, you um, what we wanted to highlight here is that the purple bars highlight uh, figures that are either more deprived or worse state in all the slides through the presentation. So you'll find that Slough has more adverse determinants of health, um, compared to the rest of the system. Uh, next slide, please. So this is about comorbidities, that is clinical conditions that exist along with the other social determinants of health. Why does this matter? So if we look back at COVID, we knew that if someone had diabetes, they had a three times more chance of dying from COVID compared to someone who did not. And that's just a small example. So if you look at diabetes on the, um, the left-hand side, it's all... Um, alphabetically ordered. So if you pick up diabetes, which is somewhere in the middle, and if you go to the columns, which have numbers one, two, three, four, and five. Now, let me first of all say that these are deprivation quintiles, 
which means that number one actually includes deprivation decile one and two, two includes three and four and so on. So the uh, 10 deprivation deciles have become five quintiles. So let's look at diabetes. We can see that compared to decile quintile five, we have at least 10% of our population in the lower deprived areas having diabetes. Oli, are you able to slightly magnify this slide at all for the benefit of our uh, members here? And if you carry the theme across, if you carry on to the right on the same line, we've got variation by ethnicity. So again, diabetes is, uh, this may be too big actually now, Oli, so let's go back to where we were. Diabetes is commoner in about 14% of our um, Asian population, and similarly with the Black population, 11%, compared to other ethnic groups where it's about 5%. And if we look at a variation by place, we already said in the first slide, for example, that Slough is made up of 61% of people who belong to the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities. So clearly, it's not a surprise that you have more diabetics within Slough with its consequences. And we know that Asians, for example, have a higher risk of conditions, uh, coronary diabetes, or uh, um, other kidney disease and so on. So generally, we also know that Slough has a higher prevalence of most of the clinical comorbidity conditions. Next slide, please. So this again, I'd like you to just focus on the bottom two charts for ease for today. So if you look at the population count and the absolute numbers of our people within the Frimley ICS who live within the deprived deciles, you'll see on the chart on the left at the bottom that 21,000 of our people live within the deprivation quintile one. That means they are decile one and two. And out of those 20,000 people, 14,000 of them live in Slough and another 6,700 live in North Assumption Farnham and predominantly that's Aldershot. And then there are very small numbers in the other places. If you then go to the right bottom chart, you can then see that we picked out four clinical conditions, which are part of the core 20 plus five. So we looked at cancer, COPD, hypertension, mental health. And again, a place which has more deprivation has these in higher numbers. We'll look at that in other slides. Uh, next slide, please. I'm only trying to speed up so we finish on time and there is perhaps time for a question or two. So this slide, again, uh, just shows us that there are more people in the BAME ethnic group, more multi-generational households um, in the lower deprivation vessels. And we know that some other communities such as the um, GRT, the Gypsy Roma Traveler community and the Nepali residents seem to live within our ICS in the more deprived areas. Again, lifestyle factors like obesity and smoking are actually more, more prevalent in these deprived population as well. Next slide, please. This is just a comparator of everything that I've been talking about with clinical conditions compared to how does it compare to the baseline with the rest of the ICS. So if you look at the, um, look at the column, which is the last column on the right, it gives you a figure of how much more is diabetes prevalent in the deprived population compared to the more affluent population. And the larger the number, the more is the increase and difference. Next slide, please. Now, this is really an important slide because it talks about cancer, the diagnosis, and so on. So I'd like to just um, take you through this. So if you look at the national screening program, which is the fourth um, uh, parameter here, in the deprivation day cells, we know that people do not engage as much with cancer screening. So you'll find that the diagnosis of cancers are much lower through the national screening program, the more deprived you are compared to the more affluent end where it's about 6.6%. So let's go up to the top where the general practitioner refers someone for cancer care or a suspected diagnosis of cancer. And again, the numbers of people in the more affluent population who are referred are much higher than those who are lower. What happens to people who are in the deprivation, lower deprivation deciles is that they tend to get admitted through the emergency departments because they do not go for screening. They probably do not um, go for help in early stages of cancer. And we find that many of them end up in the emergency department. So you'll see that number is actually higher at 6.3% in the deprived population compared to 38 in the more affluent ones. Next slide, please. 
tell uh, just a graphic representation of what happened with COVID and the time when people did not have um, access to clinical care because of lockdowns and various other things. So you'll see that regardless of what uh, status your diabetes was at, so if you look at the top purple line, um, that is someone who is more affluent who chugged along with an HbA1c, which is a parameter to monitor the state of your diabetes, they chugged along. And even though they might have got a little bit unstable during the pandemic, they stayed about where they were. Compare that with the lowest dark blue line where their HbA1c parameters were fluctuating. But during COVID, there was a really severe deterioration between Jan 20 and Jan 2021. And then as they seek help, they are beginning to get stable, but not really where they were. So it just it's a simple example, for example, that there is a larger variation if you are from a deprived population. Next slide, please. Now, um, no presentation would be complete without us touching on maternity. And this slide just shows you a little flavor of what our population is like. So we know that 32% of our pregnant mums are from the least deprived decile. And all these deciles are actually in Slough and Rushmore, which is in Northeast Hampshire and Farnham. We also know that 30% of the female population are in the lowest five deciles, but 39% of pregnant women come from these deciles. Key also is that 16.4% of mums nationally are from the Asian or British Asian mothers, compare that in Frimley to 25% of our mums, and they predominantly present from Slough to Wexham Park end of our ICS. We also know that 28% of our births in 2018 were to mothers from a Black Asian or minority ethnic background. And a key fact that we also found was that almost 72% of the births were to parents who were not actually born in the UK. Um, we know that in the age range of 15 to 54, one in five are female, but actually 33% of pregnancies are from the female population. And of course, we do know that with Slough, we've got the digital um, exclusion, which is high, which really matters to us. And of course, with all of this, there are language barriers. And in the next slide, I want to show you about the so what of what I've shared with you now. So how does this all translate? So if you look at the folic acid replacement, which every woman is supposed to take when you're pregnant to avoid um, any malformations in the babe, in the fetuses and then the newborn. So if you look nationally, the replacement is at about 25% or so. Within Frimley, we are actually better than national data. And Bracknell, of course, takes the prize for this. But look at Slough. The mums are either not aware or find it difficult to probably buy over-the-counter medication even when they're pregnant. There are various reasons for this, and they do not take folic acid conception. Similarly, if you look at our long-term conditions, we know that nationally, about 33% of pregnant women have conditions like diabetes, but within our ICS, we've got more than half, 55% of our women having one or more long-term conditions. Same with obesity, 17.5 versus 31.3%. Now, all of these makes the woman have more complications in pregnancy, increases their chances of risk to themselves and to their babies. Similarly, late bookers. So if you look at the green bar, that represents mothers from the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic backgrounds at both sides, Wexham Park and Frimley Park. Late booking is not uncommon from this population. The good news, of course, is that the rate of smoking is much lower than the national rate. And that a lot of work is going on within our maternity teams and it's thanks to them and to our population who are um, following the no smoking advice. Next slide, please. So if I take you to the right of the slide here to make it simpler, again, I want you to focus on the red and the green bars, please, because these are mums from the Black and Asian population. So as we have spoken right through this presentation, more chance of diabetes, that then means, I'm now moving to the left, more chance of consultant-led care, that then means more cesarean sections or difficult births leading to more perennial trauma. Next slide, please. And again, this just, we were interested in seeing what about the staff to patient ratio in terms of ethnicity? And you will find that um, 
if you look on the left, it's the uh, white ethnicity, and we know that there are plenty of staff who look after and understand our white population. If you look at the black African population, again, the staff ratio seems generally commiserate, but we seem to have less staff from the Asian or Asian British population. And now this is not to say that uh, if you're not from the same ethnicity, you do not care for your population, but it's just to give you a flavor of the perception that a woman may have that their culture cultural barriers, et cetera, are understood better by someone from their own community. Next slide, please. Now, this is my last slide, and I want to finish on this because this is our ambition. Our ICS ambitions, six of them are here, and predominantly, we want to reduce inequality. We want our people living healthier for longer, and we hope that this whole understanding that connected care gives us will help us achieve these ambitions for our population. I think I'll stop on that. Sam, would you like to add anything at all? No, not at all. Thanks, Alitha. I think that was incredibly comprehensive. Thank you very much, Alitha. That was very clear. And um, there's obviously a lot of data there. Um, just for everyone, for um, slides, etc., will be um, available afterwards. So all of this um, information that you may want to look at. So um, fantastic. Questions, comments, thoughts from our board, please. I'm going to start myself then with some um, My apologies there for just being able to see whether or not there are some hands up. Bear with me for, with the technology. Thank you very much for that. Um, so just to start from uh, what a uh, kick-off comment. Uh, obviously, coming out of our last two years health-wise, um, no one really is at, in the position where we are achieving the outcomes that we would want to be achieving now for anyone across our entire population. I think that's fair to say. We know about our current context and the pressures and the really um, impressive uh, joined up work that is now being done across the system, which gives us a real platform for hope for the future in the way in which uh, care and uh, life chances are being addressed. So it is great to see this uh, level of detail in the data that we are able to pull together that gives us a truth that might be uh, something that we would anticipate, but maybe not know exactly where the issues are. So across our five places, the five places will not all be the same themselves. And this is really helpful for us to be able to drill down into those issues and see where the populations are, where the gap against where we would want to be in terms of outcomes for life um, uh, really are adrift now. So thank you for that uh, level of data. Yeah, I can see two hands and uh, I'd like oh, to see- Now you see, yeah. I I can't. So I'm going to ask for anybody who can see hands just to help me along with that. Yes, um, Chair, um, it was um, Ilona and then Karen. Thank you. Um, Ilona, then Karen, please. Thank you. Thanks, Priya. Um, uh, Ilona Blue, one of the non-executive members here. Sam and Lalitha, thank you very much. Really great presentation. Um, a wealth of data, Lalitha, as, as, as you said. And this may be a, an unfair question so early on in our existence, but I was just really keen to get your um, take on, and it kind of builds on your point, Priya, about how we will use this data um, uh, to shape what we're doing, check in on how we're doing. Some of these indicators won't shift quickly, won't shift easily, but if there's anything we could just say about when we would check back in on this type of data set, what we should expect to kind of track going forward, or, or perhaps we wait, leave that to a, a subsequent conversation. But that was the question in my mind, having tried to absorb all the detail here, but thank you very much for a really clear and helpful set of data. Yeah, thank you, Luna. Yes, there's a lot of data. And what we're trying to do is to use the data very proactively and actually create change based on data. So I can give you an example, say for hypertension. So, this data then enables us to identify those with the comorbidity of hypertension and where they live. We are then going in 
to those places, reaching out to our PCNs, reaching out to our clinical pharmacies, reaching out to our uh, colleagues in uh, social care to enable our population to get their missing hypertension readings, for example, and if, they were, if it was high, ensure that they're all treated to targets. So we know, for example, within our ICS, we have 13,500 diabetics who are known hypertensives who have not yet had the check of their blood pressure because of various reasons. Uh, so if you can identify these people, we can then have a joint up response to, to enable these people to get the care they need. So we are trying to use this data for actual, real, proactive, operational stuff. Thank you. Thank you. And Karen, please. Thank you, Priya. Um, I, I just wanted to, I suppose, acknowledge the fact that I can see how this data is being used locally already, and um, the example I would give is around waiting well. My question, though, was around um, the aggregation by PCN and uh, what that might do to mask particular lower super output areas, um, very small, the small area geography around uh, data capture, because when I look at um, part of Farnborough, for example, I know I wouldn't want that missed out, and I suppose it's just, it's just, just to make sure that when we're doing that sort of data mining we kind of look at that wider intelligence and, and at that level too so we don't i know we need to start somewhere but just make sure we don't miss out those really disadvantaged communities that are, can get lost yes yes thank you and that's a really valid point and the good news is that the connected care team are able to drill down right to the neighborhood and uh, lower super output areas and actually willing to share that data and i think have already shared it with the pcns who want to do this kind of work and with social care colleagues but thank you very valid point Priya, there are a lot of hands up i can see alex prash and fiona i don't know whether you can see them you're very kind thank you in that order then thank you Lilith, a fantastic presentation, and this is what we're all about, isn't it? Population health and having the visibility and transparency of this data is absolutely fundamental. And it's really good to hear um, operationally and within place where we're using this data now to improve the health of, of the population. I'm just wondering how we take this data now strategically around the health inequalities agenda and scale up the, the joint partnership resources that we have to, to really impact. And I wonder how we determine where we go first beyond the operational and beyond uh, specific place um, areas of focus. Okay. Um, Sam, I can see you've come off mute. Do you want to come in there? Yeah, I think Alex, you're absolutely spot on, of course. And clearly, as we kind of step into our new world of ICB and new ICS construct, this is exactly the conversations that we need to be having. So we've clearly got an ICS strategy refresh coming up over the course of this year. I think our strategy in terms of its design and its, its kind of six main vehicles are the right ones, but we've got some real meaningful conversations to be had around what do we put in as our priorities underneath those six things, which address the, the very stories that Letha has just shared with us around where we have our broadest inequalities. And then as a partnership, how we work together to address those will be critical and fundamental. I think um, we're doing some great work at the moment as well, just to share, and it picks on Ilona's question too, around building a wireframe for evaluation. So some of these metrics would only change over six months, 12 months, maybe sometimes beyond that, but actually being really clear on what your starting point is, as we've just had a look at, what you'd expect to change as a result of an intervention into a particular population group or place or clinical condition, and then measuring that regularly, either through this board or our other delivery fora, will really help us to get very crisp on making sure that we're actually delivering change for the population. So I think um, it's a really exciting time, isn't it? Um, and we'll be doing that together in partnership as well. Priya, you're on mute. Priya, you're on mute. Oh, I'm so sorry, thank you. Um, so uh, over to Prash, uh, Fiona, and then Paul, please. We'll give Thank Paul you. the last word. Thank you very much, Letha. I mean, uh, very comprehensive, very detailed data. I think I just want to open it up a little bit. I, it's always difficult when you present data. You often tend to start with a very narrow sort of health view. But I think what I find quite exciting, having seen dashboards over many a year uh, for the members of the public, uh, I'm a clinician, I'm a general practitioner uh, with a bit of a foot in the hospital as well. But what I find exciting 
about this type of uh, data gathering is actually its reactivity. The way the connected care system works, and I think it was some points that were made, traditionally what would happen is we would get data that was one or two years old. By the time you made some inferences, you were already two years behind the curve. Whenever you put some kind of implementation in, you couldn't quite measure it. And I think Sam touched on the, the benchmarking. So for me, the way we're working, and we've seen this through COVID, is we're able to make data uh, quite alive to us in decision making. Um, and we can actually put in implementations and measure it quite quickly. And the beauty is we can pivot away. So what used to happen is we would um, put in quite a bit of revenue, not really be able to measure something, if at all, for a year or two, and you realize revenue or money or resources in people or financial terms has been lost. So what I'm quite excited about where we're going with this is that um, we're going to be able to pivot quickly if we can see that things are not working or actually continue investing um, if we find that things are actually moving the right direction. But more exciting than health is actually those bits that, for sake of brevity, I understand we flew over, is the fact that we can start to connect a population's health issues, which were always traditionally reactive, with something that's now linked to the way they live, these wider determinants of, of, Ill, of illness. And what's even more exciting is we've got our local authority partners around the table who are looking at the same data. We're having conversations we've never had before. We're able to link in a certain amount of reactive health with potentially what we can do far, far upstream, which has got nothing to do with health, but maybe the, with the way people live or with maybe gaps in knowledge or education or areas of inequality, which often can be cultural, they can often be educationally led, etc. So what I'm exciting, what I'm excited about is that this feels like this is how the system um, is going to move forward and make good decisions, sometimes not because we are forced to, but actually because we've got something to back uh, those decisions with. So at each step, we're making an intelligent move. But the nice thing is we can use the data to pivot away from that if we find it's not working. So no, very excited, Lalitha. And it, it's nice to see that the level of that dashboard detail and actually, more importantly, the fact that it's available to every group from general practice to secondary care to local authorities and maybe even the general public, everyone starts to become uh, part of that conversation. It becomes very democratic, I think. Thank you. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Prash. Fiona and then Paul. I tell you what, Lalith, um, sorry, Priya, why don't you let Paul go uh, next and then um, you might cover ground that I was going to cover. So do it that way. That's helpful. Yep. Thanks, Fiona. Um, yeah, very quick, well, very quick point. Thank you very much for the data set and just building on Elena's point and um, Sam's point about how you connect. Um, uh, the impact of activity on the changes that we're going to make in tackling some of these really big, these really big health challenges. Um, I suppose uh, two questions come from that. First one is, presumably it's, it's possible to slice the data by a whole variety of other themes. So what's the mechanism for doing that? And then secondly, um, uh, it would be it would be really great to see that wireframe where we're looking at interventions. I think it's what Prash is referring to, where we're making interventions in sort of one column, and then we're able to evidence the impact that those <clears throat> interventions are having on the other. And is that the intention for this data set? And to look at this on the on an annual basis, something like that, because quite a lot of these things take time to really work their way through, don't they? In terms of the re the difference we're going to make, but be good just to get a sense on on those those areas thank you yeah i can see sam wants to come in again on this yeah happy to answer those quickly paul so um firstly yes we can cut this in kind of ways that are only limited by your imagination so um you know we presented it by pcn because it's a construct that we use for both our clinical communities and for groupings within places but we could also move it by population type or by um, age or whatever it may be. And it's a, a hugely powerful tool for us. Um, and secondly, on the on the evaluation wireframe, I have seen it with my own eyes um, last week. So it is being built. It looks exactly um, the sort of thing that we're going to need um, to give ourselves the assurance that we're moving in the right direction in these areas. And yes, we'll bring it back through at the appropriate junctures, but um, all really exciting stuff. Thank you. And Fiona. 
Yeah, I want. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Well, I want. I wanted to connect this to really what is the Frimley transformation model. Um, we're beginning to name it much better. Um, so, I think that if the board needs my message to the board is have a think about um, the importance of the relational environment for multi-partner, multi-agency, multidisciplinary clinical team or practitioner teams um, to enable them to really work with what the data potentially, the insights that they're, they're getting. So um, this program of being able to build um, data that describes population need and inequity as part of the practice of operational teams. It built really, really slowly and, and, and then has started to spread. So two years ago, this would have been used in maybe one or two places, just to exaggerate, but it hasn't been driven by a top-down hierarchical programmatic approach. It has been driven by a development of learning, experimentation, and demonstrating value to teams so that they can embrace. Because you can imagine getting all our practices to um, understand the information governance risks are really low in terms of sharing data if you're doing it for patient benefit. That takes time. So, so you have to have a, the relational environment to do this transformational change. Um, and then to get to get the data bit, and then then we're going to be talking about workforce shortly, and we're going to be talking and we, we're talking about digital approaches for transformation. We don't take increasingly what Frimley are trying to do and are demonstrating is it has to be a blended proposition and a mindset. So you create a climate where people can experiment and unlearn. But the capacity that this board needs and the capability this board needs to support is the kind of digital architecture experimentation for joining up and then the data curation that's required by our data analyst team. And we've got that sat in different places in the architecture of the NHS. So we'll be discussing that as we move forward. And then um, we are also, we've got our local authority partners who are grappling with workforce crises. It's having this conversation with Duncan yesterday, where the operating model has to be much more digitized we're not going to solve our workforce gaps across public service, NHS, et cetera, through constantly saying we need more workforce. We have to fundamentally change our operating model to be much more digitally based, which is different from being data driven, but the two kind of go hand in hand. So that's in answer to Alona's question. I think there is a time piece to measure inequalities and we can certainly um, say macro kind of we want to reduce the uh, mortality gap by three years between the richest and poorest parts of our systems, for example. And we've kind of said that in our strategy, but we can be more granular learn, rather than directing learning from looking at the trends over time. So I think that's the debate for us as a board as we go forward to think about what's our role, because the tendency is we want to grab it and make a difference and actually what we're at the moment is trying to build the operational capability and a different model we've got the epic implementation in Frimley Health which will give us massive additional capacity and capability and connect if we assuming we get the connections right it's not a rival system if you see what I mean so lot, lots for us to play with and think about in terms of data-driven clinical practice, operational practice across our partners that draw, really drives integration and a new delivery model, but also the digital architecture and strategy that, that and which is all about open systems and connectivity really. Um, uh, but we've got to be really alive to the risks of some of the national models, which tend to be much more big single solution focused. And so we've got all of that to play with and think through as a board and keep an eye on and it. And it's critical for transformation. 
Thank you, Fiona. Uh, to that, I just wanted to add one more thing that has been uh, considered by our connected care teams is also the unregistered population within Frimley. They wouldn't show on any of these data sets that I've shared with you. And we can't underestimate the, uh, the problems that they have within our uh, ICS. And there are pockets of unregistered population. And we're also trying to see how we can work together with our partners to identify uh, and help a population to get the best care. I think Priya, we've overrun our time by quite a lot. We we absolutely knew we would, and um, it is time well spent. So thank you um, to the team for for bringing that degree of um, detail forward. I think um, to echo and add Fiona's comments. I think what's really important is that the granularity of that data that understanding gives all of our partners the opportunity to play their part in a way which um, organizations particularly I think from the voluntary and charity sectors feel is difficult to do with impact um, sometimes so this is a really good platform for us and the more connected we are and have the systems to uh, deliver the more important and the more impactful we will be. So thank you everybody for that. I'm going to move us now to our uh, section on workforce led by um, Safina and um, Ollie, thank you very much for driving the slides. And these slides will be circulated um, after the meeting as well. Thank you. Um, thanks Priya. Uh, and just for people that don't know me, uh, Safina Nadim, I'm the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion lead for the system um, and, and kind of leading on some of the equality, diversity and inclusion um, priorities across the system. So I've got a presentation, but I know that we're kind of restricted with time as well. So some of the slides I'll just kind of whiz through, but you'll, you will get the, the present presentation. So um, lots of the, the kind of workforce data you've, we've got today will be from an NHS perspective, only because we, we kind of, we, we seem to be uh, collecting that more sy systematically. Um, uh, and more kind of robustly through, through our kind of NHS contracts and our uh, the, the, the contracts we have got in terms of the workforce race equality standards and the disability equality standards. So there are going to be gaps in some of this data. So it'd be good to, to get people to think about how we can address some of that. Um, so just the next slide, just to give you an overall in terms of ethnicity data, um, this is for the whole of England. Um, what we, we, we know with the, the kind of NHS workforce for the whole of, of England is that 20, just under 24% of our staff are from a black and minority ethnic background. Um, and you can see that uh, disaggregated by Asian, Asian, British, uh, black, black, uh, African, Caribbean, and then other ethnicities. But when we come to um, the Southeast, um, we'll see for the next slide that that goes up to around just over 25 and a half percent. So slightly increases in the southeast region in terms of the national picture. Um, but the next slide tells us that we have actually in Brimley um, a much more uh, higher proportion of our uh, staff who are from a black and minority ethnic background. And that's mainly from our um, because of our Asian, Asian British demographic, uh, which is about 27.3%. So really high significant uh, number of people from an Asian, Asian British background uh, that are part of our system, which can give us, you know, as you know, kind of leave those comments around some of the, the inequalities for people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. I think this is, can give us some um, really good ways of, of celebrating our uh, Asian and Asian British staff, but also thinking about how do we use the uh, staff to help us with our talent pipeline and getting people into uh, positions uh, of leadership in the in the in the NHS. So that just gives you a kind of a, a picture, um, including Black and Black British um, and other ethnicities. Uh, Frimley ICS has a population in terms of black and minority ethnic background of 44%. So it's very nearly, nearly kind of double the, the, the NHS average um, and, 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 and really high uh, populations of Asian, Asian, British. The next slide. Um, and, and, and if you look at the, the kind of systems um, in the Southeast, you can see there how Asian, uh, our Asian British staff are represented across the the, the kind of six ICSs in the Southeast. And you'll see there again, 27% of, of Asian and British staff um, 
and these are whole time equivalents for Frimley. Um, so again, over representation and higher proportion of black and minority ethnic, um, sorry, Asian staff for, for Frimley systems. Um, and it's really important that people are aware of, of kind of the, our population when we're looking at um, representation in, in individual organizations. So the next um, slide um, kind of just focus on the broader areas around equality, diversity, inclusion in terms of workforce in Frimley. So the key points, I think, from our system um, is that, has a higher, that Frimley has a higher proportion of female staff compared to South East, which is 74.5%. Um, the South East is 72.5%. There's a high proportion of staff from the EE area, EEA area compared to the region, and it has a list, lower risk of retirement around, uh, compared to the South East region. In terms of our workforce race equality standard, um, we are, uh, we've got a few areas that we need to prioritise according to the data, and that is indicator five, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Staff experience har harassment, bullying or abuse from patients and public is high within our system, and then the indicator went one, which looks at progression from lower to upper band levels. So what is the progression rates from people going from lower bands to upper bands compared comparing that from uh, with black and minority ethnic staff to white staff, and we know um, there's work there we need to do. In terms of the workforce disability quality standard, uh, the main area of priority for women is, 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 is a metric one, which is the declaration rates. Lots of um, um, people are still not declaring whether they have um, kind of a disability or declaring their disability status. So something we need to do around that. And then um, just a strong, just a positive there around, we are um, positive in terms of disability representation at board level um, in terms of disability. Next slide, please, Ollie. So this is some of the, the data from the uh, organisations around ethnicity from their uh, workforce race equality standards. So if you look at representation, um, we've got the pay banding on the left, and then what I've highlighted there is the percentage of Black and Asian uh, minority ethnic staff in that band. Um, so this for Frimley, we know that 39.3% of Frimley staff are from a Black Asian minority ethnic background. But when we look at the banding, you can see clearly there that we've got high, kind of over-representation in the lower banding one and two, um, and then in the middle there at band five, which is quite no, kind of normal for, for most trusts. To have and then the higher up you go the lower um, it gets in terms of representation what what we have seen though within Brimley NHS Foundation Trust is that we are seeing progress in in that kind of band five six five and six and seven which is where the talent pipeline is we need to do a lot of work to make sure people feel um, you know we've got good representation there to get people into the the higher banding around uh, the 8a the 8bs and the 8cs so that's Brimley NHS Foundation Trust we've got Next, I think, is the Berkshire. So a similar picture there. Uh, Berkshire NHS has a workforce that's black and minority ethnic from uh, around 28%. Around 28 so you can see from that, uh, we can see that actually it, it, same picture, the higher up you get in the banding, the, the less um, representative we are in terms of black and minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, and similar picture again with um, um, Surian Borders, which is the next slide. Um, Surian Borders has a black and minority ethnic population of 30% around, um, and we can see that the overrepresentation, the lower banding, um, and then higher up again you get is the, the, the kind of less diverse it becomes um, in terms of non clinical roles. Next slide, please, um, Molly. So this is from the Workforce Race Equality Standard, and, and the colours, it doesn't mean anything, it's just the way I've, I've presented it so people can see. So what the data is telling us that, um, again, the, the, from, from the earlier um, bullet points, bullying, harassment, abuse from patients is, is high. There's a big gap, big gap uh, between black and minority ethnic staff and white staff in terms of bullying from the public. Um, and sometimes that's kind of a, a temp, a, as much as a 10% gap. Uh, bullying, harassment and abuse from staff as well is, is high, higher for black and minority ethnic staff, but big gaps between white and black and, black and Asian staff. Um, and then the, the, the kind of uh, the belief that the organisation provides equal opportunities for career progression and promotion. Again, you can see from that data, really big gaps in some of the, the differences between white and, and black and minority ethnic staff. Um, and then the, the percentage of staff experience discrimination. Um, we can see really big gaps there between white and, and black staff. So this is the kind of uh, data we're looking at to see what, what can we put in place 
and, and share across the system to address some of these uh, negative experiences and the gaps between black and white staff. We've got the disability quality standard again um, to look at the uh, experiences of people with long term health conditions and non um, long term health conditions. And, and again, with the same indicators, we can see big gaps between disabled colleagues, uh, people with long term health conditions and non long term health conditions. Um, and actually, overall, um, people with long term health conditions have a negative position than those without a negative experience. Um, so again, something that we need to focus on when we're putting our system like, strategy together. What, what can we put? What can we put in place to make sure we're addressing some of these um, issues? Have the next slide, please, Ollie. So some of the things that the the, the kind of organisations are working across uh, uh, to help address some of these uh, inequalities. You know, we've got Berkshire looking at um, how we can um, look at talent management strategy, looking at leadership offers. There's uh, lots of the organisations are looking at how we can develop um, black and minority ethnic staff, disabled staff to get to them leadership positions um, and, and then and, and kind of progress into to, to the, the, the roles that um, are underrepresented. There's a big highlight across all the um, organisations on recruitment and how we recruit inclusively. So one of the, the offers from the system has been we, we are looking at inclusive recruitment toolkit, which we can um, offer, we are, which we can, we can offer to the system to help recruit inclusively, but think about a wider pool of people when we're recruiting as well. We did it with the when we were recruiting the non the executive directors and the director force for the ICB. So we're looking at some of um, that good practice and we can, how we can address that um, across the system. Uh, next slide, please. This is some of the priorities from, from our local authorities. So we don't have as much data in terms of inequalities in the way that's presented with the, the res and the WADES, but just some of the priorities from our local authority partners, uh, which kind of links to the, the priorities actually from the NHS organisations as well. Um, so things like building allyship programmes, retention of BME staff is a big priority for Bracknell Forest. Um, we've got kind of equality impacts, inclusive recruitment, um, and then improving representation is a, is a, um, a challenge at senior level for all our, um, across, the, across the ICS. Um, so these are some of the challenges, there's some of the priorities that the um, organisations are taking forward. Um, you'll see this from the last um, EDI, uh, from our sorry, from our um, development day, and Fiona mentioned earlier around the, the, the priorities. So these are the priorities that we're looking at that will uh, have been kind of co-created with people in the system. Um, so senior leadership development, how we really you know kind of developing our senior leaders to be confident around talking about e EDI, building diverse teams at every level, then cultures of inclusion. So the bullying and harassment, we can focus on reducing that. Uh, becoming an anti-racist system so you know that was one thing that came quite clearly when we were engaging around the system is how do we become anti-racist and how do we kind of you know develop skills um, and agents of change within the system around uh, being anti-racist and the last one is about reducing health inequalities that is something that um, it got, runs through everything but one of the things that was we, people fed back is that we need one or two things that we really want to focus and do deep dives as meant as Lee Leith has done and really focus on them as a board to help understand where we are now what is it we're trying to what we want to achieve and how we want to reduce specific areas around um, health inequalities um, and I'm just conscious of, conscious of time we've got one or two slides left um, so these are some of the things that we've done we've kind of co-creating the EDI strategy we've set up a, a professionals network for the equality diversity and inclusion community and the leads across the system the inclusive recruitment toolkit I've already mentioned uh, done a really good piece of work that's we supported around just culture and that's looking at the overrepresentation of people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds going into formal disciplinary processes and what Berkshire Health did was recruit um, external people to, to help support the, this work, uh, which has really positively impacted um, on, on kind of um, the how we approach disciplinaries and, and uh, some positive outcomes there. And then the Snowy White Peaks programme, which we looked at developing student nurses um, and around inclusive leadership from a black and minority ethnic background to really prepare them for a career in, in nursing, but to give them confidence to have a, you know, to be leaders that um, want to progress and get into them uh, senior positions. And then going forward, this is some of the things that we're looking at, continue to develop that strategy, the, the robust data from all our across from, from all the organizations across the system, agree our priorities 
that's both workforce and population. And I think the data has told us what some of them priorities will be. Creating that kind of board champion and having anti-racist um, strategy and a few other things that we're looking at to develop um, across the board, including our reciprocal mentoring program um, and the cultural intelligence program as well. And then the last slide is just one, um, one save the date for you is um, we're having our Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Conference in Black History Month on the 19th of October. And this is going to help us set our priorities, understand what's working well um, across organisations, what we can, um, where we need to put our focus on um, and how to explore more. So please put that in your diary and, and welcome to attend. That's it from me. I know that was quite a fast, but I was just conscious of time. Thank you very much, yeah. Sabina. That was really clear. Thank you. Great. Um, I now have, hopefully, the ability to see hands if they do go up. And I'm not at the moment, so we will... Rachel, please. Sorry, I have a little difficulty with my mute button there. Um, I'm interested in the challenge that we're setting ourselves around change. And um, so I think you articulated really clearly um, where the issues can be identified and therefore the work that needs to be done and the work that needs to be done is also really clear. How quickly do we anticipate we will see real change um, and how soon would we be able to tell whether we're on the right track or we need to add things to the programme or, or amend the programme? What do you think? Sorry, Rachel, I, I didn't miss the first bit of the, your, it wasn't clear for me, so it might be just my connection, but I think I heard you say, go, go on, sorry. Well, I suppose I, I was just asking a question about how quickly we might think that we could make change that we could measure and, and, and be pleased with. And we can see really clearly what some of the issues are. I think that was articulated really well in the presentation. We can see what the actions are laid out against that. So it's, it's, it's really positive to have a set of actions that are so clear. How soon will we know whether we're doing the right thing? Yeah. So I think some of these actions are going to be long term. So if you look at the representation one, for example, um, and it's something that we're working with now in terms of to get in to getting people into them leadership positions when we know the gaps are further down, that'll probably be a long term, two, three, four years. Um, and I think it's for this board really to understand how they want to be cited on the changes. So if we are putting in interventions, and by the way, I think what's really important that we don't just use one intervention and assume that it's going to change everything. There's going to be lots of interventions that happen to be happening for, to get that cultural change. But things like the bullying and harassment, I think that should be something that we're really focusing on uh, from public uh, and, and patients, but also workforce um, and, and kind of cited on that quite. Um, often so we know what's working and what's not working but actually we can challenge back as well if things aren't working. Thank you and Duncan please. Yeah thank you Priya I think just picking up on that last point that was an area for me I thought the stats were quite stark in terms of particularly that internal problems we have with bullying harassment so I know we're going to be doing this anyhow, but I just think it's worth reflecting that as a board, we need to take a really strong stand about this. We need to be very visibly saying we're not going to tolerate an organisation that allows that. We're not going to be a racist organisation. And then we actually just need to keep reviewing very publicly all the actions that colleagues will be putting forward to us to make sure they're making that difference. But I would have thought with the internal issues with staff bullying, harassment to other staff, that is something we should be able to tackle and deal and deal with quite quickly. Um, yeah, say quickly within a, a time frame we'd understand of a year or so, um, because it's just not acceptable. And we need to make those statements as leaders, and that needs to be driven all the way through the management structure. It's not acceptable. So I'd be interested at some point, you know, for more information around what is happening there, um, because we've got a duty of care to so many people as an organisation, as an ICB. And we just need to make sure we're protecting everyone who's actually putting themselves out there working for the good of everyone else in the system every day. Thank you and agree. Alex? Yeah, I think um, we need to find a way as an ICB to hear and listen to the experience and how that experience is changing from our staff, because I think that is the only proof um, that we should be seeking and that we need. Uh, there is a danger you can watch data for a long time as we have nothing changes, you get initiative itis, we're doing loads of initiatives, loads of stuff, but actually when you go to the front line, you speak to your staff, 
they say this is what we need to happen these are the things that happen to us every day and we need to respond to those and they're very practical things which is a lot about not tolerating poor behavior particularly from the from the public and patients piece thank you Thank you, Savina. And uh, you have support there for next steps and also for that understanding of what makes a difference and where do we put our energy um, in, in particular around uh, the experience that staff have of working in very pressurised environments and for everyone's joint benefit. So I think that's a really important aspect for us. I'm going to move us now to our review. Um, children and young persons review and thank you this is going to be led by uh, Tracy Faraday Drake thank you Tracy thank you Priya um, thank you so much and um, just, just turn my fan off um, so um, yeah thank you so much it's it's really fantastic to have the opportunity to talk to the uh, board today um, and present the um, update on the children and young people's portfolio review. Um, I'm Tracy Faraday Drake and I'm the Executive Director for Children and Young People and All Age Learning and Disabilities and Autism uh, with the ICS. Um, within the pack, you will have received um, quite an extensive slide deck which goes through a lot of detail um, about the review and I'm not going to be pleased I'm not going to race through 30 odd slides today. Um, I've got 10 slides to share with you uh, just to kind of draw out some key features uh, from the review. So if we could start please uh, with the next slide. Fantastic and just very quickly I wanted to share and highlight the, 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 the participation that really took place um, to review the portfolio. Um, and it really has been um, a fantastic opportunity to link with place and children and young people's leads right across the system. Um, we've had lots of stakeholder meetings. We've had meetings across our neighboring ICSs with NHS England um, to really bring together this set of priorities. Alongside that, we've done some amazing work with Bernardo's and we're so pleased to have them on board um, and partnering us with this work. And what they've been doing is looking really carefully at how we can bring the voice of children and young people into this portfolio, but without duplicating all the brilliant effort uh, that goes into bringing that voice um, across our places and also um, within our um, uh, provider organisations and across our sectors. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So why did we review the portfolio? And you've already heard actually that across the ICS, children and young people um, are one of our six strategic ambitions. So, you know, this work is not new to us. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with children and young people across the ICS for a few years now, but actually, um, you know, looking forward, uh, this really marks a call to action for us. We know that a quarter of our population are children and young people. We know there's a, there's a massive variation in the care and outcomes that children and young people across our system um, have. And also we know that the pandemic has really widened those health inequalities um, and particularly around children's mental health. And moving forward, uh, the cost of living crisis has had a massive impact on families. And we know that that's only going to get worse. And more people, more families, more children will be living in poverty this year. And the health and care service that we provide to children and to children and young people, uh, all of our services are really struggling to meet demand. And what I would say is that part of this review and part of my role, I have the you know, great sort of um, pleasure really, and you know, to work with so many fantastic organisations, all trying to do their best to support children and young people, but actually demand in so much, in so many of the areas of our work is just outstripping what we can provide really. So our, but I have to say, our call to action absolutely comes with optimism about what we can do collectively. And this is a fantastic moment, moment in time really to just pause, bring our stakeholders and, and, and key people together and really think about how we move forward um, to, to develop this programme of work. So next slide, please. So just what really wanted to touch has been quite a theme in this meeting around health inequalities, but just wanted to draw this out, especially I think around children and young people. And I just want to reflect on Nisha Sharman's work uh, through Public Health England. She reviewed children and young people health inequalities and the impact of COVID-19. And I think her summary 
puts 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 really well, I think, where we are with health inequalities. That we, there is so much evidence and research that really describes the scale and nature and causes of health inequalities. We've heard of, about some of that already today, and the inequalities are really long-standing. They're really persistent, and actually, they start early. So this program of work to address this is really important. And then the drivers are really complex. Quite often we need, you know, tackling inequalities requires action at a number of levels by a whole range of organizations at scale. And actually it will take a while for us to redress that balance. Um, so we, we need to kind of make sure that we take that into account. But again, Nish Sharma really um, supports, you know, a really positive approach actually that we can make a difference but actually carefully thinking about who we need to support in order to do that work um, and, and what's been proven. So our work within the programme, working with the voluntary sector, working with housing associations, our ambition to work much more in a different way with education is really important here. Supporting communities to support their communities is what we really need to be doing. So next slide, please. So this is familiar to quite a few people around this virtual room. Um, so this is our plan. So we've got five core transformation programmes, and I don't think these will be a surprise to anybody. Um, so starting well, we continue that work across the ICS and we will be reviewing um, starting well ambition uh, over the next few months, but continuing the work that um, my colleague Sam Burrows has been leading over the past few years with, with Jane Hogg and, and Aletha with the maternity and neonatal program is really important for us. Transforming neurodiversity services. So that's looking not just at those lengthy wait times for children and young people to be diagnosed with either ADHD or, or autism, but actually thinking about the whole pathway and the whole opportunity to transfer, transform those services um, across our communities. Children and young people's mental health is, is one of our greatest priorities where we've got the greatest demand and we know that that has such a significant impact not just on the children themselves but also wider family um, and, um, and carers as well. So really focusing on that is absolutely critical to us. And physical health needs of children, we should not forget this. So looking at the areas around asthma, diabetes, and coming back to Lalitha's slides, the link to those people who are living with long-term conditions, had we done something different when those people were younger to help either intervene early or prevent those illnesses, you know, that, that's the sort of investment we need to make early on. Alongside that with physical health services, really looking at paediatric pathways, in particular things around, um, you know, the small number of children that really sadly need end of life support um, uh, within our system and making sure that them and their families have the best possible services uh, that we can offer. And of course, improving special educational needs and disability services is an absolute priority again, enabling children and young people to have the support that they need early on to really enable them to flourish through school and then work and, 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 have, and have careers um, and so on. And alongside the programmes, we've got these six enablers. And actually these are as important as those priorities because actually if we don't encompass these enablers with each of those transformation programmes, we're just not gonna make the progress we need. So every single one of those, we really need to bring the voice of children into that work using data and insights as we've heard already today, connecting really broadly across all sectors and alliance. So really thinking about our connections with voluntary community sectors and housing to really look and, and consider the wider determinants of health um, across those programs. And then creating a strategic partnership with education. You know, where do we go to when our kids are, are ill? So first GP or the teacher, you know, those are our two go-to people who know, they know our children really well. And we need to really embrace the opportunity to have a different relationship with education. Alongside that, thinking about workforce planning and development. So thinking about innovative ways that we can bring a new workforce in to support children and young people. Use, really using the lived experience of people that have really been through our system and have something that they could offer back um, and, and a career working with children and young people. 
<clears throat> and then also across all of these, the importance of transition into adulthood. So we haven't put a kind of ceiling on this um, portfolio review. You know, we haven't said well, we'll work to eight people up to 16, 18 or 25. Actually, each of the areas of work has a different period um, during the children's um, uh, children's lifetime that, that they transition to adulthood. So, you know, we, we will be working across children, young people up to the age of 25, if that's what we need to be doing. So next slide, please, Ollie, thank you. So again, just pulling out the how we deliver. So I've already mentioned a few of these, you know, focusing on the wider determinants of health, really harnessing the skills and expertise, building that capability um, and building the capacity with how it, within housing and third sector providers, having that different relationship with education, a longer term approach, co-designing, co-creating with children and young people, but also, and I think this comes to um, Safina, your presentation, actually being collaborative and really thoughtful and kind and holding each other to account for the work that we do in the way that we do it as well. It's a great opportunity here. And also just coming back to the uh, education, you know, schools are kind of real anchor institutions in our community and we need to think about how we use uh, schools and education differently to support health and care uh, and education um, across um, across the uh, across the portfolio. So next slide, please. This is just now caveat to this: um, the forty-one million pounds for those uh, finance leads uh, who are in the room. It's rough. It's a rough guide. So about forty-one million pounds is spent on children and young people's contracts. Two things I want to raise about that. So children are 25% of our population. We spend three, we spend around 3% of our ICS commission budget, and this is only health spend. We haven't looked at local authority spend. What we know is that the health spend has grown over the past few years, particularly around mental health, though we still don't have enough. Um, we know that local authorities are really challenged in some across some of our places. Um, to increase any of the funding across children and young people's services. So we really need to work, you know, through that and, and think about how we do work differently together. And something also really important here that's a particular ambition that we have within the portfolio and across the ICS, actually, you'll see that around 1% of the current investment in voluntary sector, uh, current investment goes to the voluntary sector we need to see that multiply, multiply by a lot to, to enable us to work differently with third sector community voluntary organisations. So we really have a plan to increase that and make sure that we're using and building that capacity within our community and voluntary sector so that they're able to be a really, really important part of this programme of work as they are within our um, community. So next slide, please. Just got two slides to go. Just wanted to remind you around about the portfolio governance. And we've created this opportunity for children and young people's jury. So that's a youth friendly space uh, that will offer that in proactive input and reactive feedback, but to be our kind of critical friend, to hold us to account, to scrutinize our work. We've chosen the word jury because it kind of rebalances the power, but I know that's a bit marmite with people. So some people have loved it, some people not so keen, but actually it's for those children and young people to decide what they call themselves. Um, and also the importance of engaging, involving parents um, and carers as well. So we expect that, um, that we will have on our transformation board, experts by experience, which will be parents and carers, and also on those um, five steering groups that oversee the programmes of work as well. And the other thing to note is that Sarah Bellas, our Chief Nursing Officer, Sarah and I work really closely together. Um, Sarah is our voting board member lead for children and young people. So what's fantastic for us is that Sarah will be on our transformation board and we have that direct line of sight into the ICB, which actually is really helpful, I think, is if, um, uh, if we should need that voice to really be amplified um, uh, it, it, you know, kind of in, in a really direct way. So last slide, uh, please. Well, penultimate slide, actually. So looking together, uh, forward uh, together. So this um, piece of work um, really has always been a sort of, there's always been an ambition that we will move this two year 
portfolio review into a five-year strategy. And that very much aligns with the ambitions within uh, the ICB and aligning with the work of the Integrated Care Partnership. So, we're, you know, we're bringing all of this work together bringing it here for you to support um, and enable us to move forward. And we've set aside a two week period to do that next piece of work, which is to develop our five year strategy for uh, children and young people across Frimley. So last slide, please, which is the final slide, which is a thank you so much to everybody. So I feel I've rushed through those slides a bit and I'm really happy to um, answer any questions, Priya. Um, or if people feel they'd like a little bit more time to go through, then I'm really happy to meet people on a one-to-one -one basis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy, and uh, we'll take you up on both of those. Thank you for the clarity um, of your, of your um, slides as well. So I have, in this order then, Alex, Paul, Rachel and Neil, please. Tracy, thank you. And it's a great credit to the ICB team that we've got children's um, focus on the first agenda for our yeah. ICB. So I thank you for that, because this is about starting well, better futures for, for our young people. Um, and we know we have some work to do in this space to, to improve. Um, really. Uh, grateful for the for the slides I just encourage in the August work we've got outlined here for the outcomes is perhaps to step back and think about kind of the high level measurable strategic outcomes for the work because I think that will help us determine um, as a system where the work is best done be that in place uh, system level or pan system level yeah. um, and I'd also encourage us just to think about the methodology and delivery is, does it need to be a big steering group or is there the opportunity to bring in some of our quality improvement methodology, our rapid improvement work uh, that we've been applying to system problems uh, recently and, and is seemingly quite effective. So just, just looking at the approach and methodology that we might bring in, which, which would include provider collaboration, for example. Uh, and I can see in your CYP steering group, you've got all the right stakeholders there. And I love the words encouraging collaboration to flourish. So very excited about the focus. Let, let's just think about the strategic outcomes for the work informing how we deliver. And then one last point, which was on the enablers, uh, and I think is probably implicit, but another enabler is addressing unwarranted variation of which we have masses in the system in terms of outcomes, delivery, et cetera. Um, and if we could hold that in mind, because it's a, a fundamental driver of inequalities. Brilliant. Thank you so Thank much, you. Um, Alex. Yes, and absolutely. The the outcomes, um, we are working through those um, with the teams at the moment. And I completely agree with the methodology. And I think that's what we had hoped, uh, that we would really think about the way we do the transformation um, with partners. Absolutely. So thank you. It's really helpful. I'm going to bring Paul and Rachel in, and then we'll come back to you after that, Tracy. I think. Thank you. Thanks, Priya. Uh, Tracy, uh, uh, very nice to see you and thank you very much for that presentation. I should have introduced myself earlier, Priya, apologies. I'm Paul Farmer. I'm one of the new non-exec uh, board members here. So uh, first meet, first kind of proper meeting for me as well. Um, uh, in my day job, I'm at least currently the chief executive of Minds, the mental health charity. So as you can imagine, this is something which I think is hugely, hugely important. Um, just, just a, a kind of qu question which connects to um, Alex's point about deliverable outcomes and and I think this is an area where we should be setting our ambitions high particularly on transformation of young people's mental health um, uh, because of not just because of the current scale of need but actually because of the investment piece but I'm also interested in this in the extent to which you see this as a prevention program as well as a intervention program um, and I suppose to take the mental health of young people as an example of this it would be really lovely for example to be able to say, what should every young person in Frimley know about their mental health? Secondly, what should every young person in Frimley know about how to look after their mental health when they might be struggling? And then thirdly, what kind of help and support does any young person with a mental health problem should they expect from the Frimley system, um, you know, and over what kind of time frame, et cetera? So actually kind of trying to articulate those outcomes in ways that are very much led by the, the young people themselves. So I think it'd be great to hear what they are saying to, to, to bring into this, but um, huge support for this programme. And I think it's absolutely the right place to be. And also great to see your 
focus on the voluntary sector as key partners in this from the start. And quite often, voluntary sector organisations play a role, but they're quite often brought in a bit late in the process, whereas I think actually embedding their participation and involvement right from the start is going to be really important. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Let's bring Rachel in now, and then we'll come back to Tracy. Yeah, um, so Tracy and I have um, talked a bit about this already, so I, I won't rehash the conversations that we've had. Like others, I'm really, really pleased and positive that the Children and Young People's paper is, is here today, and it's so very clearly a priority for Frimley. I wanted to draw a couple of things out and in doing so um, explain myself. So I didn't introduce uh, myself before. Um, I'm a local authority uh, board member from Surrey County Council. And so I, I kind of bring the county um, hat, I suppose. Um, but in my day job, I'm the executive director for Children, Families and Lifelong Learning. So I have a particular interest in work with children and young people um, and with schools. And one of the things I was very pleased to see was the emphasis on a changed relationship with schools. So for uh, families with children of uh, statutory school age, um, the, the location and the kind of connection with their children's school is one of the most salient factors in their life. Um, and life kind of family life uh, revolves around the start and the end of the school day, the start and the end of the school term, the accessibility of services in the neighbourhoods around schools, how, how, how quickly can you get your child seen, you know, how much interruption of the school day is that, all of those factors. So that revised uh, relationship with schools is hugely important. And three of the elements of this uh, uh, programme, three of the priorities of this programme, connect together in a really meaningful way for me. The mental health, uh, the neurodiversity and the SEND work stream. So one of the things that we see is how connected uh, those elements are and how significantly they, they impact on children's life chances. So uh, to take what Paul was saying about is this, uh, is this intervention or is this prevention, my view as a statutory director of children's services is that all effective intervention in childhood is prevention work for adulthood, always, all the time. Um, so it's, it's both of those things simultaneously if we, if we get it done right. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention was um, uh, just because our heads are likely to be very much in the health space, um, that the Department for Education is uh, in a, uh, engaged in significant policy development at the moment, of which one of the um, features is the SEND and Alternative Provision Green Paper. It will in due course, I think, be revised legislation it will change uh, the way that we work around children with additional needs and disabilities um, that was embedded in the Children and Families Act in 2014. And very specifically in the Green Paper, it's drawn hard on um, health input uh, in a way that was uh, less visible in the earlier yeah. legislation. So I think all of those things are worth us keeping in our minds as, uh, as a board as we see this come back to us in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, re really helpful. Tracy, any final words from you? Um, no, just thank you so much. I mean, it just it does feel uh, such an important sort of signal, really, for us as an ICB to be having this discussion in the very first meeting. And I think also just to thank you, Priya and Fiona, because actually, you know, for our, our chair and chief executive to have such a, a focus and a passion for, for this work, I think is really fantastic. And it just creates that um, opportunity for us to, to, to be in that place where we can really develop the work um, and move forward together. So thank you so much. Thank you. This is an area of absolute shared purpose. Exactly. Exemplifies what we're what we're all about. Good. Um, I'm going to move us then to our use of resources section uh, to be led by Richard. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll conscious of the time, so so I'll try and uh, run this through fairly quickly um, in order to, to leave time for a discussion. So just for context for the board, the ICB is not required to submit an organisational plan as CCGs historically were, but rather it submits a plan on behalf of the NHS element of the system, which is aligned to individual NHS provider plans. And I'm reporting in the context of an unusual financial environment in which the ICB has not yet received regulatory sign off for the system's financial plan for the year. Now, we are not alone in that. The same is true of every ICB nationally. Um, but what that 
means in terms of practical impact is that I can't report the system's uh, expenditure against an agreed plan at this stage in the year. So the thing I thought would be of most value is to report to the board the plan which has been submitted by the system, the risks that are inherent in that plan, both quantified and unquantified, and to ask for the board's agreement to a set of proposed next steps uh, in that paper. So essentially, systems across the country were required to resubmit plans on June 20th. Uh, that was a result of, I think, every system submitting a plan which did not reach financial balance at that time. Um, the regulator NHS EI, through which funds flow uh, from the Treasury, found some additional funding and made that available to systems. For Frimley's case, that was about £80 million worth uh, of additional funding against an initial gap of £66 million. Um, and, and we actually received a net benefit of £11.1 million because some of that flows to through to social care pressures, through to the ambulance services in, in particular were an issue at that time. Um, and, and for increased inflation to out-of-system providers where uh, our responsible population goes elsewhere. So we received a net benefit of about £11 million from that. Um, the, the third slide, uh, third finance slide in the pack describes that impact. So it has a, what we call a waterfall chart, which describes how we got from there to submitting a balance plan as at the 20th of June and the risk that is retained within that, that uh, position. So we have a residual risk of £28.3 million in the system for which we um, don't yet have identified uh, means of delivering that, that cost out efficiency. And there is a residual risk of £17 million quantified, uh, which essentially is the excess cost that we believe we are likely to incur in respect of um, the ongoing COVID pandemic. So you may recall um, that at the point that, that the um, the settlement was agreed with the Department of Health and Social Care. The working assumption was that there would be no additional COVID cost uh, to the NHS beyond the end of May. And similarly, at that time, inflation levels were assumed to be considerably lower than the, the, the extant inflation levels um, that we are currently seeing. So that leaves a, a material risk of about £45 million that we've quantified for those two elements, in addition to which there is about £8.8 .8 million of unidentified efficiency, uh, which we'd already kind of used in getting down to the £66 million. So a risk of about £53 million to the system's break-even. Uh, the papers that are presented um, don't cover capital. Um, so capital allocations currently are managed by uh, their respective lead providers and are, and are not included in this report. Um, but the, the, the system's um, obligation and duty is to remain within both revenue resource limit and capital resource limit. And so going forward, it's recommended the system develop a single view of system capital requirements to allow prioritization decisions to be taken and for effective risk-based management of available resource. And I discussed that with the strategic finance group who are in agreement. So that's a, that's a recommendation to the board. In terms of further and emerging risks to the system plan, which are not yet quantified, the papers contain uh, a number of those risks, um, which I won't read through, but there, there are material unquantified risks in the external environment, the, uh, the potential NHS pay award, uh, what is going to happen with inflation in the future, assumptions around uh, particularly Frim Frimley Healthcare's recovery of income from uh, private patient non-NHS sources which are in there. And, and those risks, whilst not quantified within the plan, equally are um, potentially emerging risks to the delivery of the system plan on top of the 53 million uh, that I've just described. In terms of the consequences of divergence from financial duties, we know that nationally there are five ECBs that were unable to, to submit a break-even plan on the 20th of June. Uh, regulatory consequences include increased reporting and oversight requirements, they include a central um, control, so a regulatory control on the sign-off of any new investments above an agreed threshold. 
Uh, they include potential restrictions on capital funding across a range of headings, TIF, digital, SCP wave capital, emergency capital is all potentially restricted until those um, systems uh, produce a, a viable plan which brings them back to balance. Um, and there is potential withholding, although this hasn't been enacted, of the system share of the additional national revenue funding. So that 18 million that came to Frimley could potentially be withheld from those systems. Now, those controls are applied at a system level and therefore apply to all organisations in the systems in question. And it is not an unreasonable assumption that the same controls will be applied to systems in which material adverse movement from plan develops as the year progresses, which kind of um, means that my recommendation to board is that we need to move rapidly to find solutions to mitigate that that 53 million pounds of risk that, that I was describing earlier. In terms of establishing an in-year system mitigation plan, that plan, as I've described, uh, contains material risk. Um, the Strategic Finance Group uh, discussed this yesterday, and uh, that group is made up of the um, senior finance leadership from all of the, the, the organisations in the system, from Frimley Healthcare, uh, from the Integrated Care Board, and also from partners um, in, in Berkshire and, and Surrey and Borders um, Trust. And, and the recommend the options that that mitigation plan is likely to include are identification of residual balance sheet flexibility uh, opportunities to increase system resource availability primarily through increased elective delivery and the utilization of either fortuitous or planned slippage against planned investments including transformation funding as a mitigation in order to close that mitigation gap um, in addition, the recommendations are likely to include the development of a post-implementation evaluation review process to be carried out rapidly for new investment with a clear uh, exit strategy identified should new investments not demonstrably deliver the intended outcomes and the establishment of a clear decommissioning process to be applied where such, such action is warranted. So next steps uh, which board is asked to accept are to uh, establish a clear view of the system financial risk in its totality, to develop options to mitigate that risk for agreement at chief executive level by system partners, develop options to structure commonality and system controls for new expenditure commitments, and to recommend a clear and robust governance process to enable the escalation and oversight of financial risk within the system, which ties into the conversation we had um, earlier about um, the standing financial instructions the, and the, the, the financial um, overview process within the system. Happy to take any questions on that, Chair. Thank you very much, Richard. Looking across, do we have any comments, questions? Ilona and then Alex and then Neil, please. Thanks, Priya. Thanks very much, Richard. It was a really um, clear and helpful presentation. And I think the, the next steps make uh, entire sense to me. You picked up one of my questions in your, in your kind of voiceover to your slides, which was around pace. Um, given the level of challenge, I just wanted to get a sense of what, what does urgent pace mean in, in, in detail, if you like. So um, it clearly that, that there is a high degree of challenge. I would expect many of those mitigating actions to be needed in, in practice. Um, so if you could just elaborate a little bit more about what you mean by you know, operating with a sense of urgency, that would be really helpful. And the other thing I couldn't quite get a handle on is if you take all those mitigations that, that you've set out, would you expect them to kind of add up to the, the, the kind of value volume of, of mitigating um, uh, steps that we might need to bring things back into balance? Or are we likely to need to identify further, further options, however difficult that, that might be? And then just the final question was or point was around um, what are our neighboring ICSs like here, given our geography? Um, are they in a sim I'm assuming in a similarly challenged position? Did they submit plans though or not? Um, anything you could say on that would be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the urgency, um, I, I 
believe that it means that we start to um, there's, there's there's a range of solutions there. So that there's something about um, new expenditure new expenditure which is in plan but has not yet been committed um and the the scheduling of that and and in many cases the assumption will be that that will be committed in equal 12 so there is already some progress made towards the the 45 million if that if that expenditure has not yet been committed on the other side there is a whole swathe of uncertainty around urgent emergency care pressures currently um, and the financial impact of dealing with those urgent emergency care pressures and clearly there is a requirement to um, to 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 deal with the current pressures which are being seen um, so so in 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 my view I think that urgency means um, very rapidly indeed I think it means recommendations to um, to to the to the next meeting, next of these meetings, uh, having gone via execs, and uh, I think I've got time in the diary um, with Alex to to discuss the process through QDF, which is the Systems Finance Committee. Um, will it close the gap? Um, do, I wouldn't like to say actually at at this stage. Um, there is. There is a whole range of uncertainty in the NHS finance world at the moment, ranging from continuing COVID costs to inflation to the agenda for change pay award and any potential pressures that come from that. And 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 we are currently um, forecasting that we will hit our plan. All of the systems in the southeast are forecasting that they will hit their plans. Um, none of the systems that submitted plans that didn't reach break even were in the southeast. I think there were three in the Midlands, one in the east of England, um, and one in the southwest uh, of the country. So we're in close communication with our regional team. They are in close communication with the national team in respect to that uncertainty um, that is ongoing. Thanks, really helpful. Thank you, Richard. Um, I, I have a question now from Neil. Um, I also have a hand up from Tony Hall, but Tony, we won't be taking questions from the public. It will only be members who are able to ask questions at the moment, um, but do pop any question uh, in writing to us or, or let us know afterwards and we'll endeavor to respond. So Neil, please. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Bryn. Thanks, Rich. I think you, you've summed it up well. I, I wanted to come in on the last one with Tracy, but I'm in, I'm in on the money. So um, look, just three observations from me, I guess. One is, I think it's really important that we as a board, at least to our communities and our teams uh, and patients show real credibility through this. I think Rich has described a very complex, traditional, if I may say so, NHS planning process. I think it's important we've got a level of credibility and honesty in how we present this uh, through to our communities uh, and our teams. I mean, I think Rich has set out the, the risks, which, which are huge, and we, we all kind of recognise those with the, with the operational challenges. I guess the one thing I would urge to add to that list of, of actions and mitigations, which is that we accelerate some of our work together in a way that will see us tackle some of these challenges. Yeah. I mean, they, they're manifested in, in, in the operational demand, they're manifested in the staffing shortages. Uh, and the premium rates and such like that we're having to pay. And actually the only way through those is that we accelerate this endeavor of partnership working. Yep. So that, I think that's tradition where we haven't delivered what we needed to in isolation. So I think that's where we can do some work collectively. Yeah, thanks, Neil. I think that's that's absolutely true. And actually the, uh, the concept of an integrated care system with a single bottom line gives us the best possible chance of of, of meeting um, this challenge, and certainly a much higher chance than we had prior. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone. Um, that's really clear. Can I have agreement then to next steps as outlined by Richard, and um, the clarity that you've given Richard about the tracking of uh, whether we are on course against that. So thank you and the steps we can take. Good, let's move now to safety and over to you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, Priya. I, I think um, I'll try and be as brief as I can, um, although I think it's, um, it's always relevant to talk about safety just after we've talked about the money. Sorry, Rich, to, to say that, because actually that's the business that we're in 
is delivering high quality, safe care, isn't it? So um, I wanted to talk to you about the national patient strategy and how we're implementing it across the ICB. Um, I think the national patient safety strategy is about maximizing the things that go wrong and minimizing, uh, maximizing the things that go right and minimizing the things that go wrong, um, which actually does support the finances because if we get it right first time, that's the most cost effective way of doing it. And it is, as I've just said, integral to the NHS definition of quality in healthcare alongside effectiveness and patient experience. I put the link into the national patient strategy so people can have a look at it in more detail, but I just really wanted to introduce and affirm the commitment for the board. Can we move to the next slide, please? So um, all, all NHS boards, even including ICBs, have to have uh, a board commitment to the National Patient Safety Strategy and have to have an identified non-executive executive director uh, for patient safety. And uh, for the ICB, it's Dr Priya Singh, um, as she does know, so that's all, that's all great. And, um, and we've introduced her to some of the key people. Um, our ICB patient safety specialist is Mel Besson, and she is on the meeting now. Hopefully she'll give people a wave um, just so that the, the board members can see her. In fact, actually, if, if when we finish the, the, the other two slides, um, she could, we can just introduce her. That would be great. We also have across all of our providers, um, patient safety specialists, um, and we have a patient safety network um, of all of those specialists working together to try and do those things that we talked about previously about getting it right first time and minimizing harm. Um, unfortunately, the, 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 or fortunately, the good news is all board members are required to complete some patient safety training, and I will send you all the link for that after this meeting, um, it's, it's something we all have to do. I don't think it's too onerous, but um, I, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Can we move to the next slide, please? So some of the current national priorities and what we're doing with them. So I think Safina, if you saw, talked about just culture in her presentation and, and that piece of work she was doing to look at how uh, staff, BME staff, um, we're, we're finding a just culture. All of our organisations have implemented and are embedding a just culture. Um, the next thing that, that, that that's happening is, um, is around national patient safety alerts and all organisations have to do this and we all work together to do it. And we, uh, pe people receive it through their own organisations and then we also have a, a quality meeting on a Thursday morning where we we share them again and that anyone can have a, an opportunity to say if there's any difficulties in implementing them. There's a national drive to improve quality of instant reporting and this is being done through a number of ways. They're updating some of the software system. So they're moving from the old national, we're moving from the old national reporting and learning system, which was NRLS to, um, and also the, the national uh, reporting system for serious incidents, which was called STICE. We love an acronym, don't we? Um, and we're moving to having um, a, a patient safety incident response framework, which is snappily um, titled PSIRF, another acronym for you all. Um, and that's, that's due to be launched um, shortly. We're waiting for the outcome of that. And fundamentally what that means, instead of having uh, a national system for um, a, a template for keep reporting the same things over and over. We'll have local safety incident responses that each organization will determine for themselves, will be reviewed off. ICB will get to review and sign, the, sign and, and support organizations and agree them with the organizations. Um, and it puts much more onus on that sign off within individual organizations as compared to how we used to do it within CCGs. Um, and, it, and it means that actually it gives the opportunity for organisations to, to move some of that re resource into doing that quality improvement rather than just reporting things. So, you know, it's a, it's a really, um, really positive thing. Uh, lots of work on patient safety, education and training, and that's some of the beauty of working together with the patient safety partners across the, uh, the patient safety um, 
people across the system. We can share learning and training and um, implementing the national patient safety improvement programs. Obviously, we talked about it before, continuing on the COVID-19 recovery planning and some of the work that we do with our patient safety specialists on that is around some of the harm reviews that we've been looking at for patients on, that have been waiting a longer time than we would, we would ideally like. Um, and then finally, extending the med medical examiner process to primary care. So the medical examiner process is a process that happens after somebody that's died, the case gets reviewed. We look for any learning or opportunities for learning, working very closely with the coroner. Um, we will either say, actually, that was great, nothing to see here, or actually there's some local learning or there's some wider learning for across the system. And we're, we've got a mechanism that we're setting up to do that. So we're already trialing the medical examiner in primary care across a couple of our practices, and that will be rolled out uh, across the system um, for the April deadline. And I think that's really it on updating where we are around the patient safety strategy. Mel, if you're around, if you could give away so people know that you're so that the board knows who you are and, and just I'm definitely here, Sarah. Thank you. And introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Melanie Pesant. I'm the patient safety specialist for the ICB. But my other title is uh, the director of quality and safety. So working as part of Sarah's team. Thank you, Mel. So I guess it's just questions now. And I can see Alex has got his hand up for prayer if you can't see hands still. Thanks, That's Sarah. brilliant. Thank you very much. And over to you, Alex. Thank you, Priya. Um, absolutely support the intentions of the National Patient Safety Strategy. Just wanted to pick up the point about the new uh, reporting incident system. We, in fact, think it's going to create an additional burden because incidents are reported directly from the individual submitting the incident up to the central system without going through any checking. Uh, and our, our sense will be uh, yes, it's great for speaking up and for sharing learning immediately from the clinician on the front line, but there's potentially going to be a, a loop of burden around checking content and detail back from the centre. So we just need to be careful about being able to release resources. Our sense it will, it will increase in admin burden. It, it is interesting, Alex. I agree. I don't think it's about releasing resources. I think it's about how we do the resources differently. So certainly from the, the, uh, the point of view of the ICB staff, where we wouldn't, where we were having to be very heavily involved in looking at provider instance, and we're not going to be. Actually, there's a huge amount of burden around the medical examiner process, so it's just um, just diverting the resources. But, but I agree with you, and I think they're, they're things that we've been talking about locally across all the organisations. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I think it is really helpful for us to be uh, clear about the mobilising of all of our assets across the system in relation to safety. I think Alex and Sarah are um, identifying and with Mello identifying all of those those issues. Um, we are we will be trained as a board. It is a key part of our our focus, as we've all said. Um, and being able to see that on an aggregated basis across the system, actually now to make a change because we haven't moved the dial on safety in decades. So to be able to make a change across the system because we are integrated in this way is a huge opportunity. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mel. Our next um, paper is on the update of our integrated care system, the next steps in terms of development. This paper has been circulated and I know that you will have read it. Um, Sam, I take it that you are happy to take questions? Marvellous. Do any of the board have any comments, thoughts or questions for Sam? Thank you. OK, um, those next steps have been uh, set out and I know that you um, will all have been aware and have been uh, part of supporting that. Thank you. Is there then from board members any other business? No. Thank you all. So before we close the meeting, uh, we have um, mem uh, members of the public uh, with questions. It is enormously important to us to have questions. So thank you to members of the public who have attended today. Um, we will be able to do that in person in the future. 
please let us know your questions. It's very helpful. And over to you, Sam. I think we've had one question in. Yeah, thank you, Priya. We've had a question from um, Kirsten Sutherland around uh, urgent care access in Slough. And thank you to Kirsten for submitting that question in advance. We will put the question and the answer um, and make it publicly available after the meeting. Um, I do have an answer to uh, read out to the board today, um, and that is as follows. So at the height of the pandemic, the Slough Walking Centre at Upton Hospital was suspended in order to reduce the risk of infection to patients and staff, and also to enable health services to focus resources on where they were needed most. Throughout this period, the Chapel Medical Centre, located in the same building, has continued to offer comprehensive general practice services to its registered patients, including our most vulnerable groups, such as homeless and asylum seeker populations. The suspension of the walk-in centre allowed for the provision of a number of additional services by appointment through all Slough GP practices, including a home visiting service and dedicated services for people with COVID-19, which included face-to-face -face appointments and assessments as well as support to access vital diagnostics, such as pulse oximetry monitoring for at-risk groups. Routine health checks were also offered to help reduce delays to care. Over the course of the pandemic, the services available have been adapted to best meet the needs of the community. Services currently being provided with the available resources include additional GP appointments bookable through all Slough GP practices and an additional GP home visiting service, which has supported people in the community with both COVID and non-COVID rated illnesses, ensuring our local GP practices and their teams have had more capacity to respond to their patients' needs. GP and nurse appointments are also available during weekday evenings and weekends at five hub locations across Slough, Chapical Medical Centre at Upton Hospital, Farnham Road Surgery, Herschel Medical Centre, Barani Medical Centre and Langley Health Centre, bookable through Slough GP practices. In addition, NHS Frimley and local GP practices have been working together to improve overall access to general practice, including providing a significant number of additional appointments. The general practice team is also expanding to include a wide range of other professionals, such as paramedics, pharmacists, physiotherapists and mental health practitioners. GP leadership of a multidisciplinary team provides an improved service by increasing the number of conditions able to be treated without onward referral to other services. New telephony systems are supporting people to get through on the phone and improved practice websites are more user-friendly with clearer practice information and signposting to self-management options. Investment has also been made in additional call handling capacity to enable call waiting times to be reduced and increase the number of calls being answered at peak times to help manage demand. The NHS app gives access to online prescription requests and rapidly expanded online consulting tools give alternative routes for requests and access to routine appointments, freeing up telephone systems for those who need to use them. As a system partnership, we recognise that our population need is constantly evolving and that whilst the most acute phases of the pandemic appear to be behind us, things are not the same today as they were before the arrival of COVID-19. To help us best plan for the changing needs of our patients, we have commenced a strategic review of all on-the-day services that we offer to our communities. The outputs of this work will be brought to a future meeting of the board and will also be comprehensively tested with the local people for their views. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. And I think um, we will be responding in writing to, to Kirsten as well, so thank you. Um, good, that brings us then to the close of our meeting. Some thank yous, some thank yous um, to all those who produce papers clear and helpful papers um, and thank you for circulating those anything that hasn't been circulated will be circulated after the meeting um, thank you also to uh, everyone and uh, through to your teams and colleagues for all that uh, is being done in very challenging times and particularly the way that teams are working together across the system to meet those challenges and to take us forward I think the one thing that um, I've been hearing across the system has been how uh, inspiring it is to see that joint working and that joint endeavour, particularly where there is pressure on everyone and the way in which we behave towards each other is a key building block of that ability to deliver the very best public services. Um, thank you all and we will uh, see you hopefully in person at our next board meeting. Keep well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Bye, Thanks. Bye. Thanks.